Welcome back to Camera West TV. My name's Carlo, and today we have a special episode of Thumbprints and Signatures. We're actually focusing on not one, but two Noctiluxes, the 51.2 as well as the 50.0.95. First appearing on the market in 1966, the Noctilux M has always been considered a masterpiece of optical engineering, allowing photographers enormous creative freedom. Now, this is the world's fastest spherical lens for 35mm photography, especially when it comes to low light. It's able to reveal very fine detail hardly visible to the human eye. Typically, photos made with the Noctilux are characterized by their unmistakable bokeh and border the line of impressionism. It is a captivating tool that presents each photographer with visual and artistic challenges to master. The Noctilux has a unique rendition of contrast which result in photos with outstanding brilliance, sharpness, minimal flare, and coma effects when shooting wide open. The character of any iteration of the Noctilux remains unrivaled to this day. Starting with the Noctilux that started it all, we have the 51.2 Noctilux which was first seen at Photokina in 1966. Now, this version right here is not the original 1966 version or 60s version. This is actually the reissue that Leica had done in 2021. This Noctilux astounded visitors to the fair and industry press with its virtually revolutionary optical properties. For those days, this lens simply offered a gigantic maximum aperture that delivered exceptional optical performance. Now it's worth stating that the 51.2 Noctilux is the first lens to feature two aspherical lens surfaces. One of the two aspherical's was made from special glass with a high refractive index. The task of the aspherical's were to reduce spherical aberrations at maximum aperture while increasing quality in the image field. During this time, the production of aspherical's was particularly a complex and costly process, and this was due to the fact that there was only one lights employee who could successfully operate the special grinding machine to make both aspherical surfaces, and his name was Gerd Bergman. Since this was Leica's most difficult lens to manufacture, there were many rejects, so Realistically, there was maybe give or take a thousand successful copies of the original 1.2 Noctilux. So the original 51.2 is considered a holy grail lens amongst Leica collectors. And as of 2021, Leica has reissued the 51.2 Noctilux, bringing this legendary lens back to life, and it's been part of the current Leica lens profile. The reissue maintains the original optical design of the original 1966 version, just with updated coatings and materials. And this lens has been optimized to perform very well on digital sensors such as the Leica M11, M11 Monochrome, and the SL2 or SL2S. And I know you might be wondering, ah, where's the 50 F1 Noctilux? Well, these are both the spherical lenses and that one is not. So you can check out our full episode of the 50 F1 right up here. Moving on to the next lens, the year is 2008, and Leica is announcing the first ever 0.95 Noctilux. Now, this is a big lens, especially compared to where we started. I think the original idea of the Noctilux was to have a exceptionally well-performing lens with a wide aperture that's relatively compact. Well, I would say that this is maybe as compact as you can go especially for having such a wide aperture at like 0.95. More than 30 years later at Photokina in 2008, Leica presents the new highlight of the Noctilux family, the 50mm f0.95 Noctilux Aspherical. This lens takes the Noctilux into a whole new dimension. To achieve this, the latest technological advances were combined with the many years of experience gained in the design and construction of both of its predecessors. As a result, the new Noctilux owes its exceptional image performance to a combination of specially formulated glass types, glasses with high refractive indexes, and two ground and polished aspherical's. And thanks to advancements in modern technology and engineering, things are a little less complicated than they were in the 1960s. So we're gonna try something a little different on today's episode. Instead of the usual walk around where we take these lenses out and kind of shoot around San Francisco, I'm gonna hand things over to a true master of the Noctilux, our friend, Mark DePaola. 
Hi, Mark Tapala here, photographer, director, and avid Leica user. Oh gosh, what drew me to the Noctilux? That goes back a long ways. Uh, my father was a photographer and uh, growing up, uh, my first uh, exposure to the Noctilux was the 51.2, the original one, of course. And I just remember the sort of reverence that he used to carry that uh, lovely lens. I think that sort of instilled in me my first love of the Noctilux. I got my first Noctilux when I was still a kid, one of the first 300 made and I've been uh, using that lens ever since, and it's, uh, it's my lens, I mean, literally, uh, I'm using it my, my whole life, yeah. The idea that the Noctilux has a unique look. I, I have the original version, the, what's called the E58. Um, it has special qualities uh, that the other versions, the other three versions of the F1 uh, don't have in that it has a smaller uh, front element, 58 millimeters instead of 60 millimeters. So there's more vignetting, you know, the entrance pupil is smaller, so there's more vignetting. So it's a, a rich sort of inclusive, warm feeling, if you will. And um, of course, they don't talk about it much, but uh, there's uh, differences in uh, coatings, you know, through the life of uh, the, the, that generation, which was like 75 to I think 2008. Um, Dr. Mandler uh, design, I love his designs. He's very human and very lifelike, uh, his designs. So um, there's a huge range of difference between the 50 millimeter F12 original lens of 1966 um, and the 50095. Um, you know, distinct, and then the reissue of the 1.2. There are three distinct lenses. The, the reissue is based on the original, you know, computations of the 50 f1.2 Noctilux, but they're very different in, in, in you know, um, manufacturing styles. The, the, the original 50 1.2 was um, the first uh, commercial use of uh, aspherical lenses and uh, these were hand ground. The early use of aspherics, which are more common on very high quality lenses now, uh, most of uh, Leica's lenses, or many of them are aspherical at this point. So then you've got, uh, it was designed by a team whose names I can't remember offhand right now, uh, the one original 1.2, and then of course the reissue of the 1.2 was based on those computations. Of course, more modern coatings and uh, a different form factor. The reissue is a lighter, very solid feeling lens. The, the original one is very solid too, but you know, di different form factor. And then of course the 095 is a Peter Carver design. So that's what that jumps way into and it uses aspherics, but they are machine ground or pressed. I can't remember actually. So, you know, they are um, a completely different mechanical approach to aspherics. The original 1.2, because they were hand ground, the two, two elements of aspherics, um, those, you know, there were variances from lens to lens to lens. It was very human. I've shot many of them and you can distinctly see the difference. They're all superb and wonderful and lifelike. So it's a handmade element. It's like a piece of art. The newer ones, there's more of a consistency. Similar, they're not exactly the same because even the original 1.2 lenses are not all, they are not all the same. I've shot those that are super sharp and other ones that are a little less sharp. I think the F1.0, you know, again, wide open, uh, might be slightly sharp, uh, less sharp than the 1.2, both in its modern reintroduction version and the original one. They're, they're, they're miraculous, the uh, 1.2 lenses. These are for a particular look. Again, I shoot everything wide open. Uh, a lot of people don't but that's my style. The, the difference between um, the, the original 1.2 and the now 50 0 0.95 of Peter Carver design is, you know, night and day. The, the, you know, Carver's designs are so advanced, still human and wonderful, and, and remains a lens to be used wide open. They're designed that way, um, but m much more modern. So there'd be what is considered to be more sharpness, let's say, just overall, but uh, in particular in the center, but it still has a human look. It, 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 it's not like some other manufacturers, some other great manufacturers where it's just sort of sharp all the way out into the corners, 
uh, which you know, a lot of people like. Um, I like uh, I like to be able to control where the viewer's eyes go by choice of composition and focus. I don't care about sharpness. Uh, you know, so it's like the sharpest, yeah, on a, on a chart, absolutely. The 095 is the sharpest on a chart. chart. But that, that, that's not the most important thing to me. What the important thing to me is, you know, how I want it to look. And I, I, I want in this digital world, things to look filmic and have a natural sharpness. And instead of like this hyper sharpness that our people are going for, and you know, uh, I, I, I prefer uh, cameras that have fewer uh, megapixels. I, really a magic spot for me is 24 megs. Recently I did an editorial on a uh, British designer for uh, Ozzy Clark from, from the 60s for L'Officiel magazine. And I used the 1.2 Noctilux for that, um, that, that work. And uh, it was a great success. And they were you know, asking me like, how, how do you make this look so 60s? It's just amazing. And I said, well, I shot most of it in film, uh, with film. And I said to them, I said, well, I used an M3 with a 1.2 Noctilux and it, 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 they were used in the 60s. So that's, that's part of it is, is the magic of the, uh, the designs and the mechanics that were available at that time. So that was a, uh, a great sort of you know, example of how I can be selective about the gear I use to get the, the, the look that I want. If you, again, know how to use it and, and uh, test it and explore and uh, learn about it, um, so yeah, it's just whatever fits my mood or the assignment, uh, I choose accordingly. My favorite Noctilux is the, the 50 F1. Uh, it's been with me my whole adult life and I, I use it daily almost. And for many, many things, even in this advanced you know, digital world, um, it, there's magic on the digital cameras with the F1. Um, it has a look it, and it's my style and my choice. The sharpness is not my focus, <laughs> if you will, sorry. But, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's an important feature, but it's not my ultimate focus. It's the feeling of the rendering of the lens. So yeah, it's, it's personal preference, really. I mean, I, I use them all in uh, different settings, depending on how I feel and depending on the job. The more time you spend, um, the more adept and the more you understand the equipment, you're, the more you're at one with it. So I always shoot wide open, always period. Um, and so, you know, for me, uh, I use NDs when it's too bright, if I don't have a shutter speed high enough, like on the SL2S, uh, but like on an M camera, I'll, you know, ND it down by at least three stops outdoors in the sun. Um, it, 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 the look is, and it was designed for operating an F1. If you're stopping down an Octolux, it's certainly your choice. It's a wonderful lens in many ways, but it was designed to be uh, optimal at wide open, like so many Leica designs, and especially Dr. Mandler's designs uh, for exploring and computing, you know, high-speed lenses. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Leica and the Noctilux uh, are, you know, sort of my connection to my life around me. And it gives me such a confidence and inspiration that like I project myself to people around I'm working with, with an ease. Not that I'm in any way comparing myself to the great athlete, Michael Jordan, but he, Michael doesn't you know, run down the court thinking, okay, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. He just goes uh, and, and effortlessly in his own style coming from just infinite hours working on his game and his, you know, fundamentals, his technique. Again, I'm not comparing myself in any way to that, but for me, it's the similar thing where I, you know, I project myself through partially through the confidence of the tools that I use. I know what they look like, you know, and um, that's my connection to the world, which is a bold statement, but it's actually really true. It's how I interact with the world around me. If you wanna uh, be a good typist, practice. If you wanna uh, be fast on a bicycle, ride a lot. If you wanna be good at using your equipment, use it a lot, shoot it all the time. I never don't have a camera on me.
Just practice going racking one direction, the other direction, focus on people moving across the frame diagonally, just, you know, perpendicular to the camera, you know, uh, challenge yourself to like follow focus and, and just quickly focus between, you know, two different elements. In car racing, it's called seat time. The more seat time you have, the, the, the faster you are. Um, or like anything, just basketball, you know, shoot free throws until you can't lift your arm anymore. Experience breeds uh, brilliance. Well, final words, um, practice, practice, practice. Shoot, 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 and that will uh, garner great results and, uh, and increasing expertise. And actually it's fun to shoot, so <laughs> enjoy. Thanks Mark for sharing all your insights on basically everything that we need to know about the Noctilux. I think that was super helpful. Um, just a few things that I wanted to go over before we wrap this episode. I'm also gonna give you a few thoughts of my own on these lenses. So starting with the 51.2, I think this lens is very era accurate in terms of rendering. It has a very nice like color palette. It's not too punchy, not too contrasty. I noticed that this lens has a very slight swirl effect when it comes to the out of focus areas. You can notice it really in like foliage, kind of in the foreground near the edges mixed with the vignetting that this lens has. It kind of pulls you into your subject, but the out of focus areas aren't as dramatic as the 0.95. According to Mark, the reissue of the 51.2 is a sophisticated lens and has an ageless look. And as for the 50.95, it's definitely a much more modern rendering. I really like how they were able to combine the dreamlike signature of the 50 f1 and basically ambitious nature of the 51.2 into this lens. I mean, you get a double spherical lens as well, but you have this wide maximum aperture that draws in so much light that it's really incredible at what this lens can do in very low light conditions. It definitely has some unique properties that I still don't fully utilize it as well as I could, but I'm sure someone like Mark, who you may have already seen, he uses it in a much more creative, sophisticated way. This lens also has a slight swirl in the out-of-focus areas. Definitely much more dramatic separation from your foreground and background all the way to your subject. You have this really unique sense of spatial depth that I covered that in the 50F1 video where it's almost medium format-esque. You know, I would go as far to say that. You can let me know down in the comments what you think. I personally do think that the separation that you get from this lens is something unique. I really don't think you can get anything like it, at least on a 35 millimeter or full frame format camera. And according to Mark, this lens has much more of a natural human feel without being overly clinical. I know that a lot of people think a spherical tends to lead to being much more clinical, which it can be, but I think the combination of what I mentioned earlier about the dreamlike nature of the F1 being imbued into this lens kind of gives it a little bit more personality rather than just sharp. So I think that both of these lenses in practical use, it's definitely geared for a slower pace of photography. So if you tend to think more about your compositions, more about how you want to work with your subject, these are the lenses for you. I think if you're gonna be doing any type of street photography, you would have to really, really slow down, especially because with a shallow depth of field with both of these lenses, it's really difficult to focus through the rangefinder, but it's not impossible. It's definitely a learning curve that I still struggle with for you know these lower aperture lenses. I definitely found myself using the LCD a lot just to get sharp focus with both of these lenses. I think every time I tried to use the rangefinder, I just would not lock focus where I needed to be. But I think it's a fun exercise in learning how to focus super critically through a rangefinder. It's definitely possible, but I think it's also part of the artistry to embrace some of that imperfection. I think from a practical standpoint, the 51.2 is much more manageable than the 0.95 for obvious reasons. But I think if you were to choose one of these for street photography, the 51.2 would definitely win, I think, out of sheer form factor. It gives you a little bit more versatility, whereas if you're using the 0.95, 
you can consider that a workout for the day. There's nothing really like shooting with the Noctilux. The point of these lenses is really to shoot them wide open and experience photography in a way where you have to think a little bit more about your compositions. But I think that's something that Mark does so well. He utilizes the Noctilux in a artful way. It's not very straightforward, but I think you definitely get a feeling in the way that these are like his paintbrushes. You have a certain type of look and you have a certain type of feel and you get a certain type of emotion from these lenses. And with that, that leaves us with one question. Which Noctilux is best for you? Personally, I think it depends on form factor and what type of look you're really going for. If you're looking for something that is ageless and timeless, I'd probably recommend the 51.2. And if you're looking for a dreamlike ethereal type of quality, then I would probably go for the F1. And if you're looking for something that's somewhere in between where you have you know, the ambitious nature of the 50 f1.2 and the dreamlike ethereal qualities of the 50 f1, then I would say go for the 0.95. I think if I were to choose one, I'd probably go with the 50 f1.2. I think it's a good combination of form factor and performance. I love the fact that it has a low aperture and it's still quite manageable, especially on the street. I would still use the 50.95. I just don't see myself using this in a outdoor setting or street setting. I'd probably use this for more slower paced, artful type of photography, or you know, if I had a portrait shoot. Having this kind of lens, you can really play with space and you can play with you know your focus plane. You can get really creative with a lens like this. And I pulled this from Leica's website, so I'm just gonna read this off here. Photographers can once again rely completely on the promise made by the first and all following Noctilux lenses. The maximum aperture is simultaneously a working aperture. In other words, there is no need whatsoever to stop down to achieve better image performance. The extreme shallow depth of field of focus when shooting wide open is a feature of the lens that can be consciously used as a creative tool. And with that, this concludes another episode of Thumbprints and Signatures. I want to sincerely thank our friends Mark DePaola and Sage for really helping me out with this video. I'm really hoping to collaborate with other photographers in the future on certain episodes. I think this could be a fun format to really showcase masters with certain lenses. So if you guys have any lenses or photographers that you think would be a good pairing for future episodes, please put a comment down below and let me know which Noctilux you would get. Would you get the 1.2, F1, or the 0.95? Let me know what your favorite is. And I wanna thank everyone once again for watching. I really appreciate everyone who tunes in to these episodes and watches pretty much all of our videos. Make sure to check out our blog post down below in the description. There we have all the photos from this video so you can view them at your own pace. And don't forget to check out likeastoresf.com and camerawest.com for all your camera needs, new or pre-owned. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And once again, this is Carlo. I'll see you next time. Oh, I got a great one. Uh, this just recently. Uh, went to a book signing for the, uh, the, the supermodel of it, Linda Evangelista. And um, there was a long line and just hanging out. And of course, I always have a camera on my shoulder. In this case, it was the M11 Mono and the 50 F10 Noctilux. Finally got to the front of the the you know the table where you know she's going to sign my book. And she looks at me before I even get there and she says, that's a great camera. And she goes, you don't see these around much anymore. And I said, yeah, no, it's great. And she goes, motions like, we'll take a picture. And so I picked up the camera. I immediately, quickly, so to inspire confidence, uh, snapped a picture, not snap, but re released the shutter. And she goes, let me see it. And I turned it around, I showed it to her. She goes, oh, wow, let me fix my hair. And she fixed her hair and then went right back into her pose again. And I took like two more frames. So I think it was like the world's shortest uh, photo session with Linda Evangelista ever. But you know, part of it was that what she saw in the back of the camera was appealing to her. And what um, I, my ease of operation gave her confidence. And that, that was a really important uh, uh, experience. So I, I, it was very cool. She's a, a lovely woman.